still doing a little bit of a deload-ish type of, type of day with this week. So first thing I'm doing is the, the deep tier plyos plus a vertical jump. So deep tier plyos, you guys all know, just getting in, uh, just doing plyos in deep ranges of motion, deep knee flexion, deep hip flexion, uh, not fully extending uh, to jump. But then I'm finishing every jump, or I'm finishing every set of deep tier plyos with a vertical jump where I do fully extend uh, to propel myself in the air. So doing this for about 12 minutes, then it's just density sets for the rest of the day. Gonna box squat. I'm gonna put 14 minutes on the clock. The plan for this density set is I'm gonna use my uh, my OVR VBT device. I'm gonna wor warm up, work to a uh, work to a weight that I can move at about 0.4 to 0.5 meters per second. I just want to stay under 0.5. Actually, I want to stay under 0.5 meters per second. Hit a bunch of singles and doubles for 14 minutes. Get as many quality reps in there as I can. Then I'm gonna do the exact same thing for a high incline press, and then I'm gonna finish up with some uh, some intervals on the bike, and that's the full day. These things are tiring. Really good warm up before I do my box squats, so I'm feeling loose already after just a few sets. When I land, I'm only gonna do one deep tier jump. So I'm gonna land in that deep tier position, I get one little bounce, then I gotta jump out of it. That went a lot smoother than I thought it was gonna be. That turn got a little awkward, so I'm gonna try to do it again and see if I can be a little bit more fluid with it. I'll just add some weight, I'll grab a med ball, do the same thing. So I get tagged in a lot of people's Instagram posts, like, uh, like Fred Duncan, for example, Schmarzo. Um, a lot of the people that like I have, disagreements on training with like people will tag me in their posts kind of asking me to give my opinion the people who do that they already know what my opinion is and uh there's a reason i don't comment on other people's instagram posts and there's a reason i don't really reply to a lot of people who comment on my instagram posts one i think if you're going in someone's comment section to like state your disagreement with them i think it's kind of obnoxious honestly like we all have our own Instagram profiles, we all have our own uh, Twitter profiles, Facebook, whatever social media, or whatever the medium is that you use. We all have our own, and if you like, if there's a concept that you see and you disagree with somebody on that concept or that idea, you're free to like make your own content on that subject matter. And I just don't think it's, I think it's kind of obnoxious to go into someone's comment section and like state your disagreement and expect that the comment section is an, a, an, is an appropriate place for you to hash out disagreements in like a thorough and like thoroughly hash out disagreements um, with a back and forth because if you state your disagreement, that person's gonna respond to you and then people will like layer their disagreements on top of one another so they'll have like one point, two point, three point, four points and it's like in a comment section, I'm not gonna respond to all four of your points and if I only respond to one or two of those points, it almost looks like I'm uh, avoiding points three and four which like it just isn't a conducive space uh, for like thorough disagreements and discussions to, to occur. So that's really why I don't really comment on other people's Instagram posts. That's why I don't really engage with other people who disagree with me on my Instagram posts. A lot of people just like message me too saying, hey, you should go into like Justin Lima's comments. I guess they don't say that directly. They'll send me somebody's post, whoever it is that they know I disagree with on and they'll like ask me for my thoughts on it. And it's like, you already know my thoughts. Um, I'm not gonna change like for example, like Fred Duncan, I'm not gonna change Fred Duncan's mind if I, if I comment on his Instagram post. So anyways, that's why I don't really engage in the comment section on Instagram. And that's kind of why I do these Q and A formats on YouTube. Like people can ask me questions on YouTube and then I can, I can make a video answering the, answering the question, but I'll only really respond to a comment or a question on Instagram or YouTube in the comment section if I know I can make it a really short, concise answer or like a yes, and, yes or no type of answer. Because um, beyond that, it's just not a very like, conducive place 
to hash out ideas. Like Angus Bradley one time said, I can either give you practical ideas or I can give you context. And Instagram, you're not gonna provide, it's not, a, it's not a place for a dissertation. Instagram's not a place for a dissertation. I'm gonna provide practical application or a practical idea. You have to figure out the context in which that, that uh, can be applied. Okay, right at 0.5 there, I'm gonna go up a little bit and now I'm gonna aim for 0.5 for all my sets. Okay, I got my density set here coming up, 14 minutes on the clock. I got 465 on the bar. My previous set at 450 moved at 0.5 meters per second, so a 15 pound jump. Gonna try to hit that 0.5 meters per second with each rep. I think I'm just gonna do singles. Try to get uh, a lot of quality single reps here in 14 minutes. All right, 0.49 on that first set. Density sets can be done in so many different ways. Like uh, today, I'm just trying to get quality reps in in 14 minutes. I don't really care about how many reps I get in. Another way I really like to do them is I put, I put 14 minutes on the clock or whatever the time is, put whatever weight on the bar, and my goal is to get as many total reps in, and then you progress it by keeping the, keeping the time the same, keeping the weight the same, and getting more reps or adding weight to the bar and getting the same amount of reps as you did last time. Like I think I, I, think I accumulated like 27 reps at uh, 205 kilos or something or 212 kilos one time in 14 minutes. That was like, I was wasted, I was toast after that shit. When I box squat, I never know if I wanna do like the West Side Louis Simmons style box squat where you like have a really wide stance, you sit back, you kind of pause, rock back on the box and rock forward to stand up, or if I just wanna like squat to a box. So I always end up doing this hybrid. It's really like ugly for me. How much do I weigh? Uh, today I was 226. 223 is like a really light day for me and then 230 would be a heavy day for me. It just kind of depends on if I've pooped, how much I've eaten, how much I've exercised in the day. So 226 is what I was today, which is pretty average. How long have I been training for? I've been training consistently since I was a freshman in college. That's when I, like I played football in college. So I got on a, on a, on a real strength and conditioning plan. And so I obviously did that for four and a half years, kept training when I was playing pro football. I mean, that was 18, so at 18 is when I really started training. I'm 31 years old now, so 13 years, I guess. What do you think of something like hamstring curls after RDLs? From my point of view, the hamstring curl stimulates a response closer to the knee than an RDL does. Well, you're correct on your assessment. Um, I have no problem doing something like a Nordic hamstring curl or a glute ham raise or yeah, some sort of like knee flexion hamstring work after something like a stiff leg deadlift or an RDL or it'd be like a hip extension uh, hamstring work. I don't do a lot of it, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I definitely think it's good to train the hamstring in both knee flexion and hip extension generally. So I usually would split it up on different days, but yeah, doing it on the same day I think is fine. Hey, Will, do you have a video on how to determine when hypertrophy is interesting for an athlete and when it's not? Increasing strength is an obvious win with little to no downsides, but hypertrophy training comes with a bunch of downsides, one of which is excessive bulk. Yeah, I think it's going to depend on what frame you currently have, what sport you're playing, the style of game that you play within your sport. Obviously, if you look, look at someone like Chet Holmgren, who I don't know how much he weighs. He's like seven foot one, but he's a skinny dude. I don't see any reason why you wouldn't want him to put on a little bit of muscle mass. Like putting on muscle mass is obviously, it's gonna help you play through contact. It's probably gonna help you uh, avoid certain injuries. It's probably gonna help you avoid some wear and tear of like a physical sport. Like if the more muscle mass you have, the more pounding you do in the post in basketball, you're gonna be able to take and recover from the following day. So it just depends, man. Um, obviously, uh, football, rugby, there's certain sports in which muscle mass plays a large role. Um, so it just depends, depends on your style of play, the sport you play, what your current frame is like. Generally speaking, hypertrophy adaptations occur concurrently with strength adaptations. Now it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship, but if you get stronger, generally you're gonna, you're gonna put on some mass too.
847. I got one minute left, so I'm going to hit one more rep. All right, same plan for the high incline press here is the box squats, 14 minutes. I'm going to use 277 pounds, trying to move it at 0.5. Uh, that's the goal, at least. So we'll see how many quality reps I can get. I'm listening to a Morgan Wallen radio right now on Spotify. I really like Morgan Wallen, Hardy, Jelly Roll, Warren Ziders. Uh, there's like a lot of really good artists that come on, but then they play Luke Combs. I absolutely hate Luke Combs. His music sucks. He has like two good songs. Uh, no Love in Oklahoma is a good one. Um, he has like two or three others, but oh, terrible. I have to skip it every time. 0.53, all right. Why did you move to fullback after college prior to the NFL? Were there pro scouts considering you undersized to keep playing linebacker? Any regrets about changing your positions? I mean, I regret it because I would have been a better linebacker than fullback, but it wasn't really my choice. Scouts came to campus, watched me practice, measured me, said I was too short. My arms are too short to um, really to hang with offensive linemen in the NFL. So I was just undersized. Um, I mean, that's really the extent of it. I got beat out by Pat DeMarco, who was an all-pro player at uh, Atlanta. Then I went to Kansas City, got beat out by Anthony Sherman. Me and Anthony Sherman, we look identical. Like, when you look at us in our jerseys and our helmets, we look identical. The only way you'd be able to tell the difference between both of us on the field was by our jersey numbers. So, yeah, that's why I moved to, to fullback. Defense is a lot easier for me. If you, if you know football, um, you understand that, like, a defensive play call is only, like, one or two words long. And you just you adjust based on the formation. You know what your run rate is. You know what your pass rate is. Um, you know what your gap assignment is. And you know where your alignment is supposed to be based on the formation and the down and distance and the personnel, whether it's 21, 22, 12, 11 personnel. But uh, offense, the play calls are like 12 words long sometimes. So you sit in the huddle and you have to know exactly which word applies to you and which word doesn't. And if you're tagged, um, you, know, you have to know like if there's some sort of pre-snap motion that, that directly affects the blocking scheme on the side of the formation you're on, things like that. So I was just, it was a tough switch for me mentally going from linebacker to fullback. But I regret it it just wasn't my choice but uh I mean yeah that's kind of the story of it all right last rep here Point five two for my last rep nice all right before I get onto the bike here I just got one more question that I wanted to answer the question is any advice on training around an injury this guy's got a shoulder injury I do have some pretty good advice uh Basically, you're going to have to modify your training a little bit, right? But there's a few questions and considerations that you're going to want to ask yourself, which is, first thing is, can you do the movement pattern? So if you have a shoulder injury and you can't overhead press, uh, like you can't, and you can't train like the overhead press like you want to train, can you still do the movement pattern absent any load? So can you still press without any load? If the answer is yes, that's, that's a pretty good starting point. Then you just have to figure out, okay, is there pain during the eccentric, the isometric, or the concentric portion of the lift? Is there only pain at certain parts of the range of motion? Is it just at the bottom part? Say, for example, you only have pain at the bottom part. You can just pin press then. Just raise the bar a little bit higher, maybe to your eyebrows or something. Just do concentric only reps from the pins. I know it's not necessarily truly concentric only, but you could do, I would call it like a guided, like if, you, if it hurts during the eccentric, I would call it like a guided drop where you guide the bar back down to the pins pretty quickly um, to spare your shoulders. Um, so like there's, there's things that you just need to consider because when you modify training around an injury, you still want to apply the same stress or as close to the same stress as your intended exercise would apply. So you want to use as close to the same load as you can. You still want to train the same movement pattern. Maybe you just have to change the range of motion. Maybe you have to take away one of the three, um, muscle actions, either concentric, isometric, or eccentric. Can't really take away the isometric, I guess. But, um, those are like the considerations that you want to, uh, that you want to ask yourself. Or, or think of. So I can make a more elaborate video on this. I've made one in the past, but 
I can make a more elaborate video just dedicated to answering this question in the future. I'll make a note of that. I'll try to do that soon, but I'm going to get on the bike, do some intervals, and uh, get out of here. All right, I got a 15-second sprint followed by a 45-second rest or just slow pedal. 10 rounds, so it's just 10 minutes. It's just a 10-minute EMOM, I guess, of 15 seconds of work. So here we go.